Hello, this is uh, this is Jonas from Catatonia. You're listening to the broadcast. Welcome back to another episode of the broadcast. Um, yeah, we have Jonas from Catatonia calling today, and uh, I'm super excited that uh, I that you are here on the show today. Thank you for calling, Jonas. Thank you. No problem. Um, you guys have a new album out since last week, and that is Dead Air, and it's a recording from your live stream event. Um, earlier this year but before we dive into that would you mind um talking a little bit about your uh, 12th studio album that came out earlier this year city burials yeah it's uh, we released it at a, at a very uh, strange time uh it was not something we would expect you know to have a new album Uh, going to be be released during a, a worldwide pandemic, uh, so it's yeah. uh, it's been a little bit strange for us having a brand new album, <clears throat> just waiting for for ourselves to promote it on tours and you know gigs in general and all that. So it, uh, in that sense, it's it's been quite surreal actually. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's an album that we're very happy with still. Uh, Uh, we so, can't really wait to to <laughs> you know go out there and, and promote it and, and play the songs live and all of that. But we it, it looks like like we have to wait a little bit for, for yeah. that to happen. Uh, but when you when you uh, wrote and, and produced and recorded City Burials, uh, uh, the the pandemic was probably not yet in sight, uh, so to speak, and. Um, Yeah, it was an interesting time for you as a band, I guess, between the last two studio albums, The Fall of Hearts and City Burials, as uh, you took uh, about a year of a hiatus and then you came back in 2019 celebrating the 10th anniversary of your uh, Night is the New Day record, right? Yeah. Um, so, and, and with The Fall of Hearts, it was kind of the new, the, the first album with the with a new um lineup uh, more or less and now with uh city Burries, that lineup was was kind of not so fresh anymore and i remember talking to anders uh about the fall of hearts back then and uh roger oyerson was like came in right at the at the end of the completion of the fall of hearts and just laid down some uh, some guitar solos um, how how was it with uh, city burials? How how was the the um, process uh, with city burials? Was he more involved uh, this time around in the whole album process? Uh, yeah, I would say so. I mean, he didn't write any music, but uh, of course, uh, over the last four years since since Roger uh, became a member of the band, we have gotten to know him very well musically and, and personally so um it all very natural in also in the studio environment and it it wasn't uh it just felt very you know like it should feel because he's uh you know he's a full member of the band and he's been that for for a long time now actually uh it just happened that he He came in so uh, late on the, on the previous album recordings. He, mm -hmm. <laughs> he wasn't able to participate that much. But, I mean, he did all of the tours and gigs for The Fall of Hearts on that touring cycle. And, uh, and then he was playing on City Burial. So it's, uh, you know, the whole lineup of things feels very, very uh, good at the moment, I would say. Uh, we have a well-oiled band right now. Uh, so all of that is very good. I just wish we we could uh, use it more now to, to play live. But you know, uh, eventually we will get back to the stage. Yeah, no doubt about that. Um, <clears throat> the first the first uh, single you released in January for City Burries was Lacquer, and 
it w- it is of course uh, a very mellow uh chill song with um lots of lots of keyboards and electronics and uh yeah I, i'm just curious how, how how you decided to put this out as a first single uh did, did you um kind of w- want to lead your fans on 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 the track that maybe the new album is going to be like not as metal as as before or yeah how how, how did you decide uh, yeah, for lacquer as the first single yeah it was partly like that because we felt first of all we didn't really uh tell anyone that we were doing a new album we didn't do any updates uh on our social media sites or anything saying that oh we're in the studio right now or so we wanted to keep it a little bit quiet and then just uh release all of the news at the same time like uh, saying we have a new album recorded and here's the first single and then we decided to go with lacquer because uh, first of all we thought it was a good song you know it's uh, it's very representative for catatonia but on the other hand it's also as you say it's a, v- a very mellow song and um, it, it we felt it was a good idea to uh, just you know get people to start talking and, and wondering what's what's gonna come next you know just to to have a little bit of a uh, sense of excitement i guess uh, <laughs> so people wouldn't exactly be sure what this new album would be all about and then we wanted to release the next single being something completely different and that was the plan and i think it worked out really well because people i mean a lot of people embraced the lacquer single uh they love the song but of course there were people saying like okay so this is the new direction now i wouldn't be interested in that and i think the album is uh you know it has a, a great variety to it and we wanted to show showcase that with the, the first two at least yeah and and these so it, it was a yeah. bit, bit of an experiment <laughs> yeah and from from what i can tell from what i saw online i think it, it i i also think that it worked and 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 got people talking about it of course and uh yeah but now with the the release of dead air you switched them around and and um but again you went for those two songs as singles <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. It it's uh, it wasn't really planned that way. I, I think we wanted to release uh, something off the new album as a live uh, for, for as singles for the live album as well. But um, I didn't know they were releasing Lacquer. <laughs> mm-hmm. The record label did that. But uh, I remember we we settled for Behind the Blood uh, because we thought it was a fun thing. It was the first. And so far, only time we played it uh, live, uh, and we thought that would be, you know, it's it's an honest rendition of a song that we've never really played live before, and and we wanted to go for that. But then, uh, apparently, they they did a another uh, single track, which is Lacquer again. So, yeah, that uh, that actually, I think they they put it out either one day or at the day of the release of the full, okay, full okay. album. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh yeah t- tell us how how was it in the studio streaming that live back then how how did it feel for you uh it was kind of nervous i would say it's not something we've done ever before and i don't think we ever could imagine that we would do something like that because uh you know uh, pre <laughs> pre pandemic <laughs> pandemic times you wouldn't really consider doing something like that because you could just go on tour as you usually do. But um, it was a little bit uh, nervous, um, a bit exciting as well, because it's uh, something different. Uh, um, we we weren't really sure, I think, what to expect from it. So we just went in there with a an open but slightly confused mind, I mm-hmm. think, and just uh, wanted to make the best out of it and, and see where we would land you know and uh but the response was was much better than i would ever imagine uh, we had a lot of viewers uh, we had loads of comments coming in afterwards so it felt really 
you know, I was I was very grateful to see the what people were doing, you know, um, uh, being interested in something like that and supporting us and, and all that. So it, it turned out to be a really nice event for us in the end. Yeah. So so did you um, the, decide later on to release the, the audio of, of the live stream? as as an album or was that the plan all along from the from the beginning no it wasn't the plan at all we uh, we had a deal that we should have the live stream available to look at for 30 days after we uh, recorded it and uh, we did that and then we took it away and then uh, a lot of people got in touch saying like you have to release this you have to uh, we need it you know they wanted to watch it again and listen to it again so you know, the record label uh, heard about this as well. So they they asked us if we wanted to release it as an album. And we thought, you know, it's a good idea. I mean, if people really want it, then why should we deny them the, the chance to to get it, you know? And for us, it, I, you know, I guess it's, it's a good thing for us as well. Uh, helps a little bit economically in, in these times. So, sure. you know, it's a it's a win win. And uh, I'm just happy that people seem to like it that much, so that we could actually have it released as a, as a, you know, standalone thing. Yeah, and 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 what what I find uh, really really nice and and like uh, how do you say it, and it gives it a nice um, authentic touch is that that from what I've, I'm hearing you 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 kept it as it is and didn't polish it around the edges or anything, right? No, no, we didn't uh, touch it anymore. I think someone mastered it, but that's it, you know. Um, I I haven't been to the studio since we recorded that thing, so we didn't do anything with it. Uh, you know, I mean, of course you could do that, but then it's not the same recording. We would, wouldn't want to release something that's altered to what people really saw, you know. If they want the same recording, then that's what... Um, yeah, Dead Air is out now, um, it was released actually last week already, now, uh, you already said that, that you, you, you guys can't wait to, to go out and play the stuff from City Burials live on stage, but we all have to wait, we all know that, that, uh, yeah, as of now, it's still uncertain when things gonna be back to something like normal yeah um looking at the long history of catatonia i i noticed uh, that it's it's uh yeah it's the end of 2020 uh hopefully this year is uh soon over <laughs> apart from what we've been saying a lot on on the broadcast where there's been so much uh, amazing new music coming out this year um, so musically, it was a great year, but uh, you know that a lot, a lot of other stuff was. <laughs> um, yeah, in in all other strange. perspectives, I think. Yeah, it's it's been shit lately. Really. <laughs> um, yeah, twenty twenty one is almost around the corner, and yeah, looking at the foundation of Catatonia that was in nineteen ninety one, so that would mean next year. You guys have a big anniversary of the band coming up. Did you think about that already? That yeah, a little bit. We we started to think about it actually uh, last year before all of this uh, stuff, and we actually uh, we had some plans going, but they were of course now destroyed by the fact that the the virus came and and you know sort of. Uh, uh, destroyed everything that that, as far as planning goes for for live music and all of that. So, what we will do probably is if next year is also going to be uh, totally empty uh, as far as live shows go, we will have to celebrate <laughs> one year after that instead, just to make uh, to make sure that something actually goes down. You know. Because 30 years as a band is, that's 
quite a bit of time and I, I think it's worth celebrating because we have you know so much music released over the years um you know i would love to do a, like an acoustic thing again that we did back in uh 2015 or uh, something like that and yeah. that was very very rewarding for us as a band so i would love to do something like that again you know uh push the boundaries a little bit and do something a little bit different so you know once everything opens up again i think we will have a lot of stuff to do uh, because uh, we have this album that we want to tour for as well so it's uh <laughs> we just uh, hope that uh, we will have time for everything yeah with the, with the growing uh discography of course, bands always want want to to promote the newest album, and that's that's perfectly fine. But I I think also it's uh, it it grows in it or I imagine it like that. It it grows increasingly more difficult to to choose set lists for for live shows or also like for 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 the one in, that you did for the live stream and that ended up on dead air um yeah so so um yeah how, how do you how do you go about that is is do you discuss it with with anders or with the whole band or uh, of course there are there are some ba some some songs that you're always gonna play like some favorites um how, how do you go about deciding which songs from like older records you you're gonna uh revisit for yeah, the for we usually, puzzle the next tour. Yeah, we usually uh, sit down the whole band together, and it also depends if we're doing a tour or just a one-off gig somewhere, like a festival or something, because it also comes down to uh, what playing time we have. Uh, if we're doing like a festival show that's uh, that has a, a shorter playing time, then we will have to try to compress the set list into something that's, uh, you know, fan favorites and maybe a couple of songs that we like to play. Uh, for a tour, it's easier because you have a, a longer set, maybe something like 90 minutes. Um, and we usually actually, before a tour, we rehearse songs uh, so that we can alter it during the tour if we, if we have to. If we realize that a certain song is not going down well at all, then we would have to to change it to something else. And it's good to have, you know, maybe a five or six extra songs that we could from from time to time, and, and also for for ourselves because sometimes you get tired of of certain songs, and it's nice to get something new in there. So it's. You know, it's it, it all depends on the different kind of situations we're in. But we, we always try to uh, make it fun, of course, for, for people to listen to. Uh, but it should also have so, some elements to it that we like, because it makes us uh, more on our toes, you know, in a live situation, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, when you... When you when you're writing and recording a new studio album um yeah in in the songwriting process and then also in the process of completing that album there's also i think it's always very important the 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 order of the tracks so so to give the album a flow um how how do you go about that is is that uh do you just uh follow your gut feelings uh, once, usually, once all all the songs are finished, or to change it around a bit to try. Uh, yeah, we usually try and do it when everything is finished. You, I guess you you most of the time you can feel already pretty early on in the process what's going to be like an opening track. But then of course you have to, as you say, you have to find a a, a nice flow that makes the album sound like a, an entity or something. Um, so it's usually when everything is done, we, uh, we experiment with different kind of uh, track orders. Uh, it's usually me and Anders doing that. Uh, sometimes we let other people come with, with opinions because it's nice to, and it's good to have, um, 
you know, a, an outsider maybe perspective on things. And uh, but it usually, I think we usually get it pretty, pretty right. Uh, not maybe not always, but <laughs> most most of the time, it's it's a. Uh, I would say it's a natural flow and, and all of that. Yeah, you just you just mentioned that sometimes early in the process, um, the opening track al already is kind of clear. Um, now looking at yeah the the one record that you already honored with a special um, anniversary tour, Night is a New Day, that was also the 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 album that started started my love for Catatonia okay, uh, back cool. when, when that was released that I, I really got into the band and uh, I think Forsaker and Departer are like really perfect examples of the right um, book ending for, for, the, yeah. for, the, uh, for yeah, an album yeah. and, and with the new one with City Burials I mean uh, that was also with hard set to divide and then the ending with untrodden with that amazing guitar solo from Roger yeah i think that that's that's on par with what you did on uh uh night is new day <laughs> yeah thank you i yeah i agree actually to a, to a point there uh but as you say night is new day is a perfect example where we could probably spot the 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 first song and the last song early on in the process because they both had you know a certain uh, dramatic quality to them in different ways of course but they, they would represent the start and the beginning very well so and I think also as you say with the new album you can definitely hear uh, you could hear early on that this has potential to become a good uh, opening track and a very good closing track Yeah, maybe one last uh, question uh, regarding the songwriting. Uh, wh where do you draw your inspirations from thematically or lyrically? It's uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I would like to say that it's uh, it's different all the time, which is it, it is to a certain extent. But, um, you know, also I feel very... Uh, comfortable with a certain kind of themes that I revolve around a lot. Uh, I just try to uh, put some variety into it, but, uh, you know, also the, the songs have a certain sound that you have to uh, take into consideration when writing lyrics. And it usually ends up with me writing about the same kind of topics all the time. But, um, You know, it's um, it's not only about everyday life. It's it's also inspiration can come from films, uh, books, or you know, just events um, in a life uh, that's uh, that has uh, some kind of dramatic, or maybe not that dramatic, but you know, a certain style to it that can be adapted into a, a song lyric or something yeah it's it's hard to say but something like that <laughs> <laughs> um what, what i found uh especially interesting for example in tracks like um nephilim they, it, it's just it's such it's such a dark and evil song and then suddenly you 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 go la 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 yeah. and i'm like <laughs> Wow. Okay, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> no. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's it's a bit different, but also that song is a bit lyrically different from uh, what I'm usually doing because I thought the song was so kind of more doomy. Uh, so I felt it should have some a bit more uh, of a biblical theme to it. But uh, yeah, that that la 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 part is is. It's nice. It was influenced by a, a Swedish uh, band called Morte Macabre. Yeah. Which, yeah. Uh, you know, they have a, a members from Landberg and Anekdoten and, and some proggy stuff. Absolutely. Uh, and I really love that Morte Macabre album. So I wanted to have something that, you know, touched on, on the same kind of vibe. So that's why it's there. Beautiful. That that's that, that's uh, really cool to find out. Um, yeah. <laughs> you 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 also 
n n like these these uh, yeah uh, Swedish under underground prog gems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would yeah, would actually they 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 deserve so much more attention. Um, those Agreed. Bands. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about musical inspirations, we also all, always end our show with or, or our episodes with with a section that we call "What's in Your Walkman," where we like to ask our guests what they've been listening to lately. If there's anything uh, you want to recommend to your fans, to our listeners, yeah, that stood out in the last days or weeks that you keep. Can, kept coming back to and listen to it a lot yeah that's that's a cool feature yeah um so yeah what, what, what have you been listening to lately um i was listening to music just before doing this interview because i was cleaning the kitchen and i like to <laughs> to have some music while doing that because it's so boring and <laughs> yeah, um I, yeah there is uh, uh, there's a British singer. Uh, he's calling himself Blanco White, uh, that I discovered kind of recently, and I think he's uh, he's amazing. He's got a super nice voice and, and really cool music. Uh, so to a song called "Colder Heavens," which is uh, it's beautiful. Um, yeah, what else? Uh, my my my, fa my favorite to, uh, uh, album to to put on when I'm cleaning my apartment is uh, Tiger from Danger and Dream. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Maybe I should try that. And, oh, it's good to have some variety for the, uh, the, the, the other. Music. The other choice would be um, Dune from Klaus Schulze. <laughs> okay, okay. So a bit of uh, filmic stuff going on, or is it? Uh, yeah, the, I'm not sure. I'm the the so. the Klaus Schulz uh, album Dune is uh, is actually uh, I think there's one one song on each or one one composition on each side of the vinyl. Yeah. And uh, what what I love particular about that album is that it features the cello of I think the guy is called Wolfgang Tiepold or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm I'm. I played the cello as well a little bit, not as well as okay, cool. this guy, but uh, yeah, the, <laughs> the addition to of the cello to all these synths is like really, really beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a very uh, uh, mighty instrument. Yeah, it it can add some uh, very dramatic stuff if you put it in a in a mix somewhere. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. You were like you, um, you were searching no, your mind for, yeah. for another recommendation. And I was looking through my <laughs> my Spotify. Uh, Sylvian is something I, I listen to a lot, all of the time, pretty much. Uh, I think his whole discography is uh, so varied. Uh, you can get uh, a lot of stuff. From there, you know, some proggy stuff, some uh, electronic, a lot of electronic stuff, uh, and always his very, very nice voice, and, and the lyrics are also excellent. So that's one of my, yeah, hearts actually. Yeah, that, even when I'm not cleaning the kitchen. <laughs> that, that was that was uh, David Sillian, right? The, you, the, yeah, you dropped out for a second there. Okay, yeah, David Sillian, definitely. And any any particular track that you would recommend? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many to choose from, but uh, I would say there's a song on the album Secrets of the Beehive that's called uh, "The Boy with the Gun." It's uh, very nice, very uh, mellow, um, emotional, but a little adventurous as well. I think. Very cool. Um, I, I I'm familiar with the name for a long time, but I never really uh, took the time to check him out. I guess that's that's the right time right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my recommendation this week would be also from from Sweden, uh, progressive uh, rock slash metal band Wolverine just dropped a new uh, mini audiovisual album on their website, A Darkened Sun. 
which is a okay. really interesting uh, way of releasing the album because it's it's kind of a, a short film, like half an hour movie. You can watch it on Wolverine Wolverine's website. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I will hope maybe I, I can talk to the guys at one point because I would also find it interesting if they plan to release it, like you know, on the uh, as a CD and also on the on the normal streaming platforms mm. uh, at one yeah. point. But right now, it's just on their website, as far as I know. Um, also, uh, the opportunity to talk to you, Jonas, uh, kind of reminded me of. Uh, your uh, guest vocals with Arion back in the day uh, on the yeah. Zero One album, and yeah, yeah the, the the opening track Age of Shadows with We Are Forever, um, uh, obviously, um, plus the Waking Dreams with Anike. <laughs> um, mm, I yeah. think are, be are beautiful tracks, and and also the. Uh, your appearance at, at the Aaron Universe was really, really cool. I had the chance to be there and, and witness it live in Tilburg a couple of years okay, ago. Okay, cool. And that was uh, really cool. And then because Aaron just had his like 25th um, anniversary as, as a project, <laughs> um, and we did, uh, or my colleague Van did a huge uh, history special uh, about him on our website, the Proc Space. Um, it also reminded me of like before you you were a guest singer on an Arian album a couple of years a couple of albums before on the Universal Migrator there was also some Swedish melancholia going on with um, now now his name is eluding me uh, the guy from Tiamat <laughs> all right uh, you won Edland maybe yes Yeah, he he was singing on the My House on Mars, which is the opening track of Universal Migrator Part One, I think. Okay, all right. Um, like this super nice slow, uh, synthy driven, melancholic stuff. Um, and finally, finally, I just can't get enough of this album. Probably my album of the year from French artist Woodkid. Um, I, I talked about it. It's not prog. It's like yeah, symphonic pop, whatever. I don't know, but it's the the pop album that touched me the most uh, ever since Crystal Linder's uh, songs from the Silent Years. Even All though Crystal right. Linder uh, released an album last year, I think, which was re really really good as well. But uh, the new Woodkid album just like straight to my heart. So I'm okay. gonna put something of that. Uh, the the track is called "So Handsome Hello." I think from Woodkid's new album. I'm gonna put it at the very end of the the accompanying playlist to this episode, uh, where we also gonna put, of course, a lot of Caratunia stuff, starting with the singles um, from the new live album, Dead Air. Jonas, it was so great to, uh, to talk to you. Thank you for your insights into yeah. the <laughs> Caratunia universe. Yeah, um, my pleasure. And thank you as well. Uh, my pleasure and honor to to have you here on the broadcast to you and also to our listeners thank you for listening well to you thank you for talking <laughs> um, take care of yourselves take care of your loved ones and listen to great music yes agreed <laughs> The Progcast is a production of Stuist Media and is presented by the Prog Space. It is produced by Randy M. Salo, Janine Stengel Lewis, Blake Lewis, and Dario Albrecht. Our theme music is by This Is Not an Elephant, and Van Kirsch does our graphics. New episodes of the Progcast drop every Monday and Thursday. And don't miss our Friday Top 5 episode where we discuss our favorite new releases from that week. For more interviews and reviews in the written form, check out theprogspace.com.